Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Steve Palm, and I work at Goddard Space Flight Center. And uh, I'm an atmospheric scientist that mainly deals with LIDAR, LIDAR remote sensing, clouds and aerosols, both from aircraft, ground-based, and uh, satellite. And we're going to look at a very novel application of LIDAR today, uh, which is blowing snow over Antarctica. And I wanted to thank David, David Bromwich, Dr. Bromwich, and Julian for inviting me here to speak. I really appreciate the opportunity. Always wanted to visit uh, the Bird Polar and Climate Research Center, and I finally made it. So, uh, Okay, so this is actually a picture of blowing snow. How many of you guys have been to Antarctica? Yeah, pretty good, good, good amount. I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been. Ho hope to get there one day. Uh, okay, so I'd like to uh, acknowledge my co-authors, Yokoi Yang, Vinay Kayetha, and Re Rebecca Pauly. They're in our group at Goddard. And as I say, we're looking at blowing snow uh, right there. I think that was a picture. Whoop, did I do something? Did I do something? Apple software. Oh, oh, OK, this is, that's on the computer, right? <laughs> I know that, that, I've seen that before. It comes up on my laptop. OK, cool. Thank you. Uh, I think that picture was taken from Operation Ice Bridge, which is a NASA program to take altimetry measurements over the ice sheets in conjunction with ISAT and ISAT-2, or a bridge between ISAT and ISAT-2. So I, I love that picture. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Just a general outline. I'll have a few words about the importance of blowing snow, the structure of blowing snow layers, and we'll look at drops on measurements through blowing snow layers, or what I call blowing snow storms. Uh, we'll, we'll look at the climatology of blowing snow over Antarctica. We've had 11 years now of Calypso data, which is the data that I'm going to, going to be using here to look at blowing snow. And so we have 11 years uh, of data now. Blowing snow sublimation and transport, a uh, paper that I just wrote recently and submitted on the transport and sublimation of blowing snow. We'll have a few slides on that. We'll look at what's missing and errors involved and a summary. Okay, so why, why study blowing snow? Well, when I made up this slide, I was actually impressed with myself in that I could come up with eight bullets of why one should study blowing snow. The first one, probably the most important, is because it's an important part of the mass balance of ice sheets. Both uh, the two terms being the transport and the sublimation are part of the mass balance equation. And aside from precipitation, the sublimation of blowing snow is the largest term. Uh, atmospheric moisture, hydrology. It's important in the hydrology cycle. It's been shown that 40 or 50 percent of the snow deposited in the uh, northern latitudes over the Canadian plains, for instance, uh, 50 percent is sublimated by blowing snow processes. Paleoclimate. I'm sure many of you guys are involved in that type of research from ice cores which would depend on a, an accurate knowledge of precipitation. Uh, blowing snow has an effect on the interpretation of precipitation. Atmospheric chemistry. I got involved in recently people with the British Antarctic Survey, and they're doing studies of blowing snow over sea ice, where the snow wicks up sea salt from the ocean underneath, and then when the winds come and blow the snow, make it airborne, sea salt nuclei are deposited into the boundary layer. They react photochemically with sunlight to produce uh, bromine and chlorine species. 
and that has uh, impacts on ozone. So these very these people, uh, British Antarctic Survey researchers are very interested in blowing snow over the sea ice. Uh, regional radiation budget, it affects the long wave uh, outgoing radiation over the ice sheets. Model improvement, we can use it for uh, validation of models and improving models of blowing snow. Human impact, how many have been in blizzards where blowing snow has reduced visibility to zero? Anybody? And of course, you wouldn't want to try to drive in that, would you? No. So it does have a human impact as well in, in populated areas, maybe not so in, in Antarctica. Uh, altimetry range delay, that, that is actually what got me started on this 10 years ago, was I was involved in an ISAT, the ISAT project, which is a LIDAR altimeter, measures very accurately the height of the ice sheets to determine changes in the ice sheets. It turned out that blowing snow impacts that measurement. It, 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 it basically delays the pulse, making the surface look lower. And so, um, and this, this graph right here shows an example of the range, what we call the range delay. And this graph is actually for ISAT 2, which will have a less of a uh, range delay than ISAT 1. But it's still in the 10 centimeter level, and when you're trying to measure the elevation of ice sheets down to a centimeter, which is what they're trying to do, the blowing snow has a big impact. So we need to know about it for, for that too. So it's a lot of different reasons why we would study blowing snow. Okay, so what's a presentation without a movie? Now I gotta warn you, this is a low budget, very low budget movie, so don't get your hopes up. But I wanted to show you, introduce you to blowing snow as measured by Calypso. Does, that, does, does everyone know what LIDAR is? So they send down light pulses, laser pulses, and measure the backscatter. And so what we're going to see here is backscatter from the satellite, the Calypso satellite, off of blowing snow. And I want to show you in this way to get, so that you get a feel for what these layers look like. So we'll just cycle through a number of days in this presentation. Now, I don't know if I hit the advance button, will that actually start it? Be Brian, we may have to do it from the computer. Yeah, because normally, like a play button comes up. Yeah. And, but um, up in the upper left, where is, these are the, the tracks of Calypso. Calypso measures in, a, in a, just a, um, a nadir measurement along the ground track. And the green shows where the ground was detected. So black would be where clouds, intervening clouds, obscured the view of the surface or of the blowing snow. So you could only retrieve blowing snow in areas where you can see the ground, basically. On this side is where, where the green is, is where the blowing snow was detected. Okay, so all this, all this green is shown down here. Okay, so all those tracks are kind of smushed together. That's why they look like they do. You could go ahead and uh, hit that. There you go. Okay, so we're just cycling through a number of different days so that you can see what the average blowing snow layers look like. And simultaneously, you know, how many, how, how much of the area is covered by blowing snow. In this area, in the winter time, it's generally about 70 to 75 percent of the time we get blowing snow. As you can see, most of the layers are about 100 meters, 200 meters thick. Rarely we get up to three and 400 meters.
And I think that's it. So as you can see, it's quite, quite prevalent over uh, a large area of Antarctica. This is East Antarctica. And I want to show you also more detail of the blowing snow layer structure. So in the top, top panel, we have one continuous blowing snow layer retrieval that spans 1,500 kilometers. And that's basically the distance from Dallas, Texas to here. Quite a ways. One continuous layer. And you can see the, uh, the height of this thing is reaching 400 meters. To put that in perspective, what's that? Does anybody know? Empire State Building. Yes, Empire State Building. Who has not? been up in the Empire State Building. Oh, I'm surprised at you yeah, back there. Uh, you got to do it. Quite a view. So anyway, that shows you the, the uh, relative height. The height of the Empire State Building is 380 meters. So that's how, how tall that blowing snow layer is. I wouldn't want to be standing in the bottom of that. <laughs> and. Uh, Okay, so the middle panel, the middle panel, this is uh, 210 kilometers. And what I want you to see, which is always present in blowing snow, can you see these little white, what I call cells? See one here, one there, one there. See them everywhere? Those cells, they look very much like convective cells. For years I've studied. Uh, marine and uh, land boundary layer convection with LIDAR. And it looks a lot like that, very similar. So they look like convective cells, but we know it's not convective. We're over the ice sheet. More than likely, it's dark. Um, and the bottom panel, we also see another scale where you see these, these hummocks here, one there, one there, one there, there, there. They're about 14 kilometers. But the smaller scale is, is still present, as you see up here, which is about two kilometers. So it's a very interesting structure in these layers. And you see it all the time. If you apply a low pass filter to the data, this is what you get. You take out the small scale, and look how regular this stuff looks. It's incredible. These undulations are about six kilometers apart. So why, why might that be? Where is that regularity coming from? Where is that structure coming from? Well, part of it, the longer scale, is coming from what I call streets. Is anyone familiar with cloud streets in the atmosphere, where the clouds kind of line up in rows? You see it on satellite, and, and I'll show you the next, the next slide, and you can see that. But this is, this is a, uh, a MISER image. MISER is a multi-angle imaging spectroradiometer. It takes pictures at various angles as it goes along the track. And when it, when it does so, it, it can retrieve the height of clouds or any structure in the atmosphere, the height of the surface. Um, and so these lines here are, this is blowing snow, OK? This is the, this is the, uh, the this happens to be ice sat, OK? And in this picture, you can see these small cells very plainly, like we saw in the other, the other view graph. And uh, these are about two kilometers. That image here was taken along this red line, right in here. And down here, this is the miser retrieval of the height of the blowing snow layer. You can see it's about 200 meters, 250 meters, um, from, yeah, 2,200. Oh, wait. Terrain height, 2. 
Because that's 400. It's closer to 400 meters, right? But you see the regular undulations because they did the height retrieval along that line, which is perpendicular to the streets. So what we see is an eight kilometer wavelength of the streeting of the, of the blowing snow. You don't see that here because the ISAT track was right along the access, access, axes of the streets. And cloud streets, this type of streeting is um, th theorized to be caused by roll vortices in the, in the atmosphere. But again, mainly, mainly associated with uh, convection. So that's, that's interesting. There's the Cloud Street picture. That was like one of the best ones I've ever seen over the southeast U.S. We see all the, the clouds are basically aligned to the mean boundary layer wind. And you can see the cyclonic curvature that was behind a cold front and a cyclone, cyclone that moved through the previous day. So very similar type structure to the, to the blowing snow. OK, let's switch gears a bit and talk about the thermodynamic structure of, bound, of blowing snow layers. Is anyone familiar with Concordiasi project? I know David is. It, it was a project, as stated, uh, from 2008 to 2011. Uh, I found out about it about two years ago, and what, what I was interested in was the drops on measurements that they, they used uh, the stratospheric balloons that went around and circumnavigated the pole and the vortex and dropped. They, they took in situ measurements, but they also used drops ons. And every one of those red points is a drop on. So I said, wow, this is fantastic. One of those daggone things must have gone through a blowing snow layer, right? Or, or would it be Murphy's Law that none of them did, right? Well, anyway, so I went off looking for that. And sure enough, I found quite a few. Quite a few, actually. Now, before I show you that, we got two profiles, temperature profiles up here from different days. And I want you to vote to tell me what looks like the stereotypical Antarctic temperature profile. Temperature is black. Blue is duple. Which one, do you, which one looks like the stereotypical? Do you think one looks more stereotypical than the other? If so, which one? Who says A? Raise your hand. Two? The rest of you say B? Ah, you won't, you're non-committal. <laughs> did you guys vote in the last election? <laughs> I hope you did. Um, OK, so stereotypically, normal temperature structure in Antarctica is a strong inversion in the lowest few hundred meters of the atmosphere. Okay, And that means it gets warmer with height. That's that. Right? Does that get warmer with height? No. It doesn't get warmer with height. What that looks like is in my days of studying convective boundary layers, it looks like a well-mixed layer over land or water. Okay? Looks like a convective layer. Kind of like those little cells we were seeing in the prior slide. So. What causes that? In the middle of Antarctica, in the middle of night, why do we get that? Is the drops on malfunctioning? I hope not. Okay, here's what I think is happening. 
Uh, on the top, we have our familiar by now blowing snow layer from LiDAR. Down here, the red lines and this blue line are all of the blowing snow detections from that day from Calypso. Okay? And this guy happened to go right through a dropson drop, or very close to it. That's the cross right here. And that's the data shown here, 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 and here. Now, this Calypso Pass was at 0555 UTC, 12th of October. The drops on was seven hours later. Okay, 12. So they're not they're not lined up in time, but they're certainly lined up in terms of space. Uh, 2.8 kilometers from the track was that drop zone. So, okay, so what, is, what does it look like? Wind speed. Okay, wind speed we, we, at the surface, 14 meters per second. Pretty, pretty hefty wind and probably it's going to stir up some snow, right? And look at the increase in wind speed up to the top of, a, of a, about 200 meters. You get up to 24 meters per second, that's 53 miles per hour, for those of you who like English units. So definitely a lot of wind, and a lot of wind shear. The directional wind shear is quite, quite evident too. Here is the, the dew point and um, temperature profiles that we saw from the prior slide. This is potential temperature, again indicating well mixed. Uh, this is relative humidity. Now, the relative humidity, 30%, I don't particularly agree, uh, believe, because I think there are errors in the, in the moisture sensor of the drop zone that haven't been corrected, and Dr. Bromwich agrees with that. Um, but the main point here is not the value of the relative humidity as, as much as the well-mixed nature of the layer. So is it the blowing snow that's doing that? Is it the wind? The wind causing turbulence and mixing, mixing down some of the, the warmer air? Because if, if you look at that, look how much the surface temperature has increased. If this wasn't here and we just had the stereotypical inversion, our surface temperature would be close to minus 60, right? But what is it? It's minus 50. So the temperature, surface temperature has gone up a whole 10 degrees Celsius, quite a bit. Very interesting. Now this is a MODIS, what I call false color. Is everybody familiar with MODIS? Okay, multispectral imager, um, many, many, many different spectral bands. I call this false color to bring out blowing snow because if you look at a scene over Antarctica in the visible, what do you see? White. You can't tell blowing snow from the ground, the ice and snow underneath. If you look at it in the IR, Usually you can't see much of a difference either because there's not much thermal contrast between the surface and the blowing snow layer. But if you use this technique, which uses, whoops, I knew I would do that. This technique, which uses the 2.1 micron channel and a visible channel for red, green, and blue, the underlying snow surface becomes blue. The blowing snow becomes, it's interesting, a different color than it's on my monitor, but here it looks like kind of a grayish or dirty white appearance. And you can see it all through here. The, red, the yellow lines, these are, these are where Calypso has detected blowing snow for that day. So all here, all up in here, this is all blowing snow. And even the stuff down here, this was the position of the drop zone. So well within the area covered by the blowing snow. 
And if you, if you do a computation, that area covered by the blowing snow is larger than the state of Texas. Okay, and one other example of the drops on measurements is shown here. The, the top panel is, again, the backscatter from Calypso showing blowing snow along this red track down here. The plus sign is the position of the, of the drops on, but this Calypso data was taken about nine hours prior to the sonde. So the sonde was uh, 2208, October 10, 9, and this is 13, October 9. Uh, but again, spatially, we're very, very, very well lined up. And then we had other tracks, which were green and blue here, from about uh, nine hours later, the following day, on the 10th of October, about nine hours after the sonde. And these lines indicate the closest position of this track, of these tracks, to the sonde location. And so again, we see the height of, of about 200 meters, uh, which corresponds fairly well. This is maybe, this well mixed structure is maybe about 150 meters thick there. Uh, but we know that blowing snow started back at this time and became much more prevalent and intense uh, as time went on into the next day, as indicated by, by these tracks here. Again, the wind speed, similar, 14 meters per second at the surface, and up to uh, 26 meters per second at the top of the layer. This is the modus false color again for October 10th, showing the position of the drops on here. That red line that went right through the position nine hours earlier. Here we see very plainly the blowing snow is all here, even down into here. Again, the yellow lines, blue, green, are all retrievals from Calypso. This is probably cloud. And this is all clear. The blue is all, all clear. And uh, down here is the track along here, with this being the closest position to the drop zone right there. OK, and then just to kind of summarize what I've seen, and I, I can throw up a lot, of, a lot more examples of this. This is just typical. And that is the drop zones with and without blowing snow. So whenever, and I've never found an, uh, an exception to this, when it, whoops, whenever you have blowing snow, you always have some type of well-mixed structure to the temperature and moisture. Whenever you don't have blowing snow, they look more like that, stereotypical. So not that I've gone through all 600 and some drop zones, but uh, I, I feel pretty confident that that's, that's the way it would play out. OK, uh, another thing we've done with the data since we've been taking it for 11 years now is produce a climatology of blowing snow. By that, I basically mean a frequency. A frequency, uh, this is a March to September frequency for the years 2006 through 2015. And it shows you the relative frequency of blowing snow um, spatially for each year. And you can see how constant the pattern looks year to year. 
Yes, you have some interannual variability in certain locations, but overall, the pattern is very, very constant. And that's not to be, not, not surprising. The catabatic wind regime is pretty stable, right? And that's what's driving the blowing snow. Uh, what, what's surprising and what a lot of models do not pick up is where the maximum is. This is the area that we were looking at with MODIS just before. Uh, I call this the Megadune re region. Uh, has the highest blowing snow um, frequencies of up to 75 percent. We can look at how things change month to month. And as you would expect, in the winter time, you get the maximum. May, June, July, August, maximum blowing snow. You get considerable blowing snow from March through October. And only the months of January, February, and December, and November, I guess, too, have low blowing snow frequency. So it's there year-round, uh, but especially from March through October. And ice sheet mass balance. Well, we mentioned that before. Uh, what I'd like to talk about now is the sublimation of blowing snow. It's an important part of the mass balance equation. Q sub s, Q sub t is the transport. Q sub s is the next largest term in this equation uh, beside, or I should say, after precipitation. So we're going to use Calypso data and Mera2 data to compute sublimation. Now, up until now, as far as I understand, the only way to get it blowing snow sublimation was through parameterization, through model parameterization. Darian Yao did so back in 2002, uh, and this was their result. Uh, basically, you parameterize Q sub s on wind speed. That's about all you can do. You have a threshold wind speed, which is dependent on temperature. And whenever the wind speed, the 10 meter wind speed, is above your threshold, you've got blowing snow. Right? And then you use this equation, these equations, which incorporate relative humidity and temperature uh, to, compute to compute sublimation. So that's what has been done up until now and gave us that result. So what I'd like to do is use the actual Calypso data to get back sublimation. Don't, don't rely on parameterization, but use actual observations. So to do that, I'm not going to go through all this, but this, this is the basic, the basic uh, technique. Uh, we must compute the particle number density in the blowing snow layer. And the only way to do that, this is the measurement that Calypso makes right here. This is the backscatter. Okay, that's the, the, the physical measurement that Calypso is making. To, to get particle number density, we need to know the extinction. You can get extinction from backscatter if we know what's called the extinction to backscatter ratio, often used in LIDAR, okay? And we know the values quite well for cirrus clouds. Nobody really knows it for blowing snow. It's not been measured. But so I, I chose a value in the middle of the range of what is known for cirrus clouds. And so that, that gives us the extinction, uh, the extinction, which then, if we also know the radii of the blowing snow particles, which we don't, but we can use an estimate from field measurements and from theoretical calculations and model, uh, we can estimate that, okay? So once those two things 
are known, the extinction and the radii. We get back uh, particle number density. From there, we get the blowing snow mixing ratio, okay, using the particle density and, and the radius. Uh, and then the sublimation, which is this nasty term here, incorporating the temperature and relative humidity in the layer. And then you integrate through the layer uh, from, the, from the ground to the top to get the column integrated blowing snow sublimation. So here's what, here's what we've, we've gotten. On the left is the wintertime average blowing snow frequency. We've already seen that. On the right is the sublimation for the same period, um, 2007 to 2015. So what you see right away is, wow, you know, we've got this really high area of blowing snow frequency, but it doesn't line up with the sublimation. Right? Why, why is there a lot of blowing snow there, but not much sublimation? Well, the reason is over in this graph. The sublimation is very dependent on both temperature and relative humidity. So, for instance, at 70% relative humidity, if, if your air temperature is minus 50, you have almost two orders magnitude less sublimation than if the air temperature were minus 10. So in here, in this area, it's very cold. Even though you have a lot of blowing snow, it's cold. Plus, the model says it's very moist. Model, uh, model says 90% relative humidity or higher. So you don't have uh, a large amount of sublimation in this area. You pick it up here at the edge of this high frequency zone because the temperatures are warmer, the relative humidity is less. And the same reason why you have the high sublimation along the coast, temperatures are warmer and converse to maybe uh, what you might think, the model says it's drier along the coast, even though it's closer to the uh, ocean. But that's probably because it's warmer. And this shows our result on the left compared to what Derry and Yao produced from the parameterization. Uh, you see the pattern is similar. In other words, they, they've got the highest sublimation values along the coast which is the same as, as our result. The values are somewhat higher and are very much higher in certain areas. Look at this area here, you know, versus this. It's 10, 20, you know, versus something over 100. So uh, there, are, there are large differences. If you integrate over the area, it's about 100% more. So, a big difference. This shows you the sublimation for the years 2007 to 2015. Not really a lot, not much more to say about it other than the pattern is very consistent from year to year, just like the frequency, the blowing snow frequency. And that's to be expected. Just wanted to say a, a few words about transport as well. Uh, this is the, the MODIS false color image of the same area of Antarctica in this area. And I want you to look down through here. This is the coast. The red line is the coast. Uh, these two plumes, which are blown up down here, uh, this is the coast, are being blown off the continent by the catabatic wind. and you might even see a little bit of that streeting structure in through here if you can see it from where you're sitting. Um, this is the AMPS model for the same day showing you the wind speeds in that area. Very high. So 
uh, that's a phenomena that we see quite often, especially in this area of Antarctica. And one thing we did was we computed sublimation uh, uh, transport, blowing snow transport, um, for all the years 2007 to 2015. And we, we, we computed the sublimation at 50 kilometer increments along the coast, everywhere along the coast, every 50 kilometers, all the way around Antarctica. Okay, and we computed the amount that was being blown off the coast at all those locations and then summed them up. Okay, and this is the, this is the number by year, an average of 2.44 gigatons per year of snow is blown off the continent. And that's a number I don't think that, as far as I know, anyone has estimated before. Now, these columns, uh, we got East Ant Antarctica, West Antarctica, about half of East Antarctica. But uh, what I wanted to show you is over half of East Antarctica's total comes from this small longitudinal range, which was basically where I was showing you in the prior slide, uh, this area right here. So a lot of that comes in, in, that, in that small, relatively small area. Um, and I think this is, uh, this is uh, West Antarctica, showing you that over half comes from, from that longitudinal range, which is in here. And then on the right is the uh, average sublimation in millimeters, snow water equivalent, integrated, uh, I'm sorry, average, uh, average over the continent uh, by year. And if you integrate the sublimation over the area north of 82 south, because our measurements only go down to 82 south, um, you get this number by year with an average of 393 gigatons per year of sublimation. Models have said that we're probably more in the range of 2 to 250 is what they, I think the current estimates in some of the later papers so these numbers are somewhat higher. So what are we missing? Well, there's a lot of stuff we could be missing. One thing is, all the layers that I showed you are at least 30 meters thick because that is the vertical resolution of Calypso. We can't see anything below 30 meters, really. We can't separate out the ground return from the atmospheric scattering uh, below that level. So, and there's a lot of blowing snow that, that happens very close to, I guess they call it drifting snow, less than 10 meters height. You know, a lot, a lot of times that happens over Antarctica. Those of you that were there, have you ever seen that? Yeah? So that's one thing. Another thing is when thick clouds are present, we cannot detect blowing snow because you can't see below them. And that's a limitation of LIDAR. Uh, Calypso has limited spatial sampling, right? It's just those daggone curtains, those lines. You saw that MODIS area of blowing snow? Humongous. But we're only sampling those lines that, you know, along those lines. So that's another limitation. And we have errors in the sublimation calculation, of course. Snow particle density computation relies on knowledge of extinction to backscatter and particle radius, like I mentioned. We probably know them to within maybe 20%, 15, 
So that's going to be an error, unavoidable. Errors in the Meritu temperature and moisture data. Well, there's certainly errors in that. The model reanalysis over Antarctica is probably not that good. Uh, not correcting for possible attenuation above the blowing snow layer. That would reduce your extinction, retrieved extinction, reduce the sublimation. That's not really a big problem except for along the coasts because much of Antarctica in the interior is cloud free or has very, very thin cloud cover optically. So that's only a problem around the coasts. So what I'd like you to take home and finish up here, thanks for your attention, uh, is that blowing snow over, Antar over Antarctica is very frequent, very ubiquitous, 75% of the time over large areas. The thermal and moisture structure within the layer is well mixed, very analogous to uh, a convective layer uh, over land. This could be due to wind-driven turbulence, shear-driven, wind-shear-driven turbulence, and possibly the destabilizing influence of the blowing snow itself. That's rather speculative. Drop zones indicate the sublimation process does not saturate the layer. The common knowledge or, or theory is that when blowing snow gets going and sublimation processes happen, the layer becomes saturated. Makes sense. You're putting water into a layer, the layer's trapped, it's capped by an inversion. It should eventually become saturated and sublimation would stop. Well, the drop zones don't indicate that. Okay? They, if you notice, they were quite dry, even in the even in the blowing snow layer. We had dew point depressions of 10. 10C. Um, is it the drop zones that are bad? I don't know. I, I think some of that is a problem with the drop zone, but I don't think the layer is saturated. And the reason I don't think it's saturated is I think that entrainment processes at the top of the layer bring down dry air, okay, and mix it, the convection mixes that in the layer and keeps it relatively dry or keeps it from being saturated. Um, Continent-wide integrated sublimation is 50 to 100 percent higher than model parameterized estimates. And the amount of blowing snow, amount of snow blown off the continent is significant at about three gigatons per year. So that's really it. It's just uh, Pretty much it. We've, we've got a new paper that's been submitted. It's at the cryosphere for discussion, if you want to go take a look. It basically uh, it talks about the sublimation and transport aspects of blowing snow. So thank you very much for your, your attention. I really appreciate it. And as a musician poet used to say or did say, the answer is blowing in the wind. For all you youngsters, you're probably saying, what? No, you know Bob Dylan. Yeah, you know Bob Dylan. All right, cool. Thank you. <laughs>